Oh, well, thank you so much for the introduction, Amrit. And it's great to be here, and I'm glad to provide you all with some entertainment and hopefully an informative talk when you're all in lockdown. I hope everyone's staying safe. Uh, we've all sort of been there at different stages um, of the pandemic, and I'm glad that everyone's you know hopefully in good spirits. And uh, I can hopefully give you something to pass the time with something that's educational and informative. So I'm going to share my screen here and jump right in. And I think the process here is I'm going to uh, give a talk for about 45 minutes about some of my work on, on sea cucumber conservation. However, if you have any questions you want to ask, I, I'll be sticking around afterwards for lots of questions. You're also welcome to pop them in the chat so you don't forget because I will be filling a lot of information, uh, throwing a lot of information out there. So if you have a question that's very pressing, pop it in the chat and I'm happy to answer it as I go along as well. Um, I work a lot with high school students so I don't mind uh, hands being raised and, and grabbing a few questions midway. And also I wanna make sure that I'm telling you all about uh, things that you're most interested in. So I'm happy to take a deep dive into some of the sort of side areas that I might mention. So let me share my screen here and hopefully this all works. Here we go. Excellent. Is that working okay there, Emirate? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Now if I just switch one slide here, it was looking okay? Yes. Excellent. Okay, last time I did it for some reason we had some issues. Um, so yes, hi, I'm uh, Dr. Teal Phelps Bondroff. You're welcome to just call me Teal. And I'm the Director of Research for Oceans Asia. And I thought I'd start by introducing our organization. We are a marine conservation organization that is based out of Hong Kong. I'm obviously here in the west coast of Canada in Victoria. And um, as Emmert was saying, we work on investigating, monitoring, and researching a range of marine issues with a strong focus on wildlife crime and illegal fishing. And we also, we do a lot of different projects Asia is a huge continent and there's a lot of challenges facing our oceans, as I'm sure many of you will know. Um, around Hong Kong, we monitor illegal fishing operations from our small boat. There we go. Uh, we also in investigate wildlife crime and trafficking. And we work on a wide range of issues like transshipment, uh, some seahorse crime. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't include a few fun pictures of some of our other projects. We work on cetacean conservation. This is one of the two uh, resident cetaceans or whales, uh, cetacean species in Hong Kong, the Chinese white dolphins. They're a beautiful pink. If you ever visit Hong Kong, they are very showy and they like to put on uh, an excellent performance. And then the more elusive finless porpoises. I'm just working on a report on finless porpoise conservation in Hong Kong as well. And one of the other issues we've been working on lately, and this might be a conversation for another day as well, is marine plastic pollution and debris. And I'm sure you've all seen beaches like this, unfortunately. We've been doing a lot of work on that. Um, and most recently, we've uh, been working really hard on uh, PPE and personal protective equipment and face masks as a result of the pandemic. Um, one thing we noticed on the beaches in Hong Kong is an increase of single-use plastic face masks as a result of the pandemic. And we recently released a big report on that. And we've been trying to encourage people to, yes, please wear a mask, stay safe, but also uh, consider using reusable ones. And also encouraging governments to uh, improve and, and query their, their waste management systems. But today's topic is sea cucumbers, specifically sea cucumber crime in Sri Lanka and India. And so I'm going to kind of start by telling you the story of why I've started looking at sea cucumbers in the first place. It's not the first species you might think of when you're thinking about marine conservation. You might think of whales or seals or, or sharks, um, but not often about sea cucumbers. So the origin is basically, it starts with shark fins. So my colleague in Hong Kong has been looking at shark fin conservation for, for years. And one of the conversations that we had a couple of years ago was it seems like things are going better for shark fins. The United States just had a ban. The UK just implemented a ban. China's been making some progress. And while things are very bad for sharks still, don't get me wrong, the question that we had was, what's next? There is a demand for luxury seafood product in, in Southeast Asia. And when that demand shifts away from shark fin, Someone's got their, uh, their microphone on there. <laughs> well, but when that demand shifts away from shark fins, where will it go? And so we looked at the next possible suspects. And we looked at the four treasures of Cantonese cuisine. These are our luxury seafood products. One of them is shark fins. Then there's abalone, fish maw, and sea cucumber. So 
if you look at, uh, for example, shark fin, we've explored it a little, it, it, we've done a lot of work on that. There's heavily interlaced with crime and, and millions of sharks are killed each year to, to feed shark fin soup. But fish maw is a little less well known. This is the, probably the topic of our next bit of research. The fish maw is the swim bladder of a fish, the, the part that allows it to raise and fall in the water column. And you're not mistaken, that is $21,000 um, Singapore for this chunk of, of fish maw. And so we're not talking about, you know, the fish you might buy at the market. We are talking about incredibly expensive marine wildlife products. So fish maw, this is an example of a fish maw that we spotted in Singapore a couple of years ago when we were still able to travel. And um, this fish maw is being sold for $98,000 Singapore, which is roughly 1.95 million Sri Lankan rupee uh, for about 300 grams of fish. So we are talking about big money and big money attracts greed, it attracts organized crime. And so one of the projects we'll be looking at in the future is, is fish maw. We didn't look at abalone recently, uh, mostly because in the last 30 years, there's been a lot of really good research on abalone and how the abalone trade in South Africa, for example, is heavily linked with organized crime. And you actually have a triangular trade down there wherein abalone is traded for guns and methamphetamine precursors in a cash-free economy. Um, and that's been well documented. So we, we didn't think we needed to look into that. But the one species that was really neglected was uh, sea cucumbers. I must also admit, this is a, a picture of a krill, that uh, another driving factor was I, I find myself very passionate about neglected species. And, you know, the species that are less charismatic. So krill, I could spend years studying krill. They're fascinating. Um, and, and one of the challenges you get with these less attractive species is that you can't use the traditional approaches to conservation. Uh, this is a wolf fish. I believe they're threatened. And as you can see, it, it's it's got a kind of fun, ugly, sort of a fugly look to it. It's not particularly the kind of fish that you could see a B-list celebrity cuddling or putting on a billboard, for example. And you don't have, you know, you don't have the big eyes and they're not fuzzy. Or in this case, the wolf fish does have big eyes, but it doesn't have that kind of fuzzy cuddliness of a baby seal or of a smiling dolphin. So it's harder to get people to connect with the animal. Also, it's hard to do advocacy and, um, and, and education because you have to teach people what the species is first before you can talk about why we should protect it. And so you're kind of making up, a it takes a lot more steps to commu do communications when you're trying to work on protecting one of these species. Everyone knows what a tiger is. If I said a tiger is a large striped cat, um, you know, and it's got black and orange stripes and they're, they're a predatory cat, you would think I was really talking down to you. But, you know, you would not feel the same way if we talked about sea moth or a more, you know, obscure marine species. And then on top of all that, you have, uh, it's just difficult to get funding for obscure species because people really care about like large charismatic animals. It's very hard to motivate them to care about krill. And there's longer causal chains. You don't always have people directly hunting the animal. It might get killed incidentally, or there may not be a very large market for it. So all these things make it harder to work on these kind of neglected species. Um, oh, before we get to that. However, um, this is a beautiful, uh, one of the giant uh, sea cucumbers out here in the West Coast. But there are some benefits to working on these neglected species like sea cucumbers. And that is that you can make a, you can have a big impact. There aren't a lot of other groups working on the issue and there hasn't been much work done. So a small organization can really make a lot of progress and, and have a large impact, which is something that I like to have. I like to, you know, I like to spend my time having an impact. And, you know, if you look at some things like krill, for example, krill are a keystone species in the Southern Ocean. And as a result, um, if you protect them, you protect all the animals that depend on them. And, and not only that, but when you're investigating and doing work on less popular species, the people you're targeting, the criminals who are engaged in wildlife crime, don't have their guards up. So they're not expecting you to be infiltrating them or monitoring their operations because they're engaged sea cucumbers. It's just a sea cucumber. Don't worry about it. Um, as opposed to highly organized and covert operations engaged in, say, ivory smuggling or in smuggling of other more uh, valuable or more well-known products. So these are kind of the benefits. And one of the things I'll just say, because I am an academic scholar, so this is, I promise you we'll get to some fun stuff in a sec. But the... The other challenge you get with trying to tackle this kind of wildlife crime is it's really hard. I mean, you guys are all divers and, and, and people who care about the environment. So I'm sure you can see the beauty in this lovely sea cucumber, but it's very hard to convince a government to care about, say, a sea worm. Um, but 
if you frame the issue, if you present the issue as, as crime, as opposed to a moral issue, you can actually get governments to act. What we have with, with relation to crime and sea cucumbers is smuggling, poaching, and then associated crimes like tax evasion, corruption, uh, violence. And so governments do tend to care about those things. Governments care about people who are not paying their taxes. And if you can find a link between money laundering operations and wildlife crime, they're more likely to act. And so that's one of the things that we've been, been working on is looking at wildlife as a criminal, organized criminal enterprise, as opposed to just an administrative crime. Um, and if you look at the international definitions of organized crime, they are basically more than three, more than or three or more people operating in a protracted period of time, engaged in criminal activity with a high level of planning. That describes an illegal fishing operation to a T. And so, if we think about illegal fishing as organized crime, it helps move uh, move governments to take action. Hopefully. So let's talk about sea cucumbers, the fun stuff. So these are sea cucumbers. They're fantastic. There's over 1,700 species of holothuridae. Uh, so, so sea cucumbers that have been described around the world. They've often described as the earthworms of the sea. And they, they burrow into sediment and they engage in what's called bioturbation. So they are a live creature that's cycling through the soil. And um, this is a really important role. So they're deposit feeders and they... Uh, and they're really important in the nutri in nutrient cycling. And I'll show you an example here. This is, um, oh, there we go. <laughs> I promise you got videos of sea cucumbers uh, defecating here, but sea cucumbers defecate a ton. And this reduces, oh, hold on here. Okay, I'll let this run for a second here. This reduces the orga organic loads. It redistributes sediment and um, it has a really important role in spreading non-organic, uh, inorganic nitrogen and phosphorus. So this little sea cucumber is excreting uh, really important keystone elements to building uh, a reef. And just so people don't get too mesmerized by that. Um, and this is really important to, to reef health. And not only that, but the, the act of sea cucumbers cycling these products also uh, increases the alkalinity of seawater. So it reduces the acidity of seawater. And that really helps protect uh, reefs against ocean acidification. And they, uh, sea cucumbers do a ton of bioturbation. There was a research report a few months ago. Hold on here. Ah, here's the proper video. There we go. This is the longer one. Uh, there was, there was a, vi a, a research project a few years ago, a few months ago rather, that looked at coral reef sediment uh, cycling for sea cucumbers. And they looked at a coral reef on Heron Island Reef, which is in uh, Australia, just in the southern sort of portion of the Great Barrier Reef. And they looked at one species of sea cucumber, the, the lolly fish or the holothridae uh, atra. And they looked at a small section of reef that was about 19 square kilometers. And they calculated that in a single year, sea cucumbers would defecate 64,000 metric tons of, of poop um, into, into the sea. That was about 3 million sea cucumbers, 38 grams a day. And they calculated that that was about the equivalent in weight to five full Eiffel Towers. So that is a ton of sediment that's being cycled. And this, this, this poop that you're seeing here, it is very mesmerizing, of course. I'll, I'll play it one more time as I wrap up. But it contains uh, calcium carbonate, which is important for coral formation, ammonia, which helps fertilize and, and helps the coral grow, and a bunch of other um, elements. And again, it lowers the acidity um, of the water around it, which is really critical for, um, for protecting reefs. Sea cucumbers are fascinating, and I'm actually working on a small piece on just sea cucumber butts, uh, because there is an entire story to tell about the sea cucumber butt. Um, sea cucumbers are food for other species, but they're also habitat for other species. This is the pearl fish, which actually lives inside the anal cavity of certain species of sea cucumber. You probably weren't expecting us to take a deep dive into this topic today when you, when you signed up, but the pearl fish will actually climb inside the anal cavity of the sea cucumber. And one thing that's fascinating is you've got this complicated um, relationship between the two animals. And the some sea cucumbers are fine with a pearl ship fish living inside of them. Um, sorry, some of them are not. And they've actually evolved dental uh, anal teeth that bite um, to keep the, uh, the pearl fish out. And um, it's a sort of fascinating uh, commensurate uh, relationship. Some other sea cucumbers have a very fascinating defense mechanism. 
These are the uh, Cuvarian tubules. Some of you may have seen them if you've accidentally disturbed a sea cucumber, hopefully not too often. Um, and these are sort of a sticky, toxic tube that uh, clings to attackers, probably wetsuits as well, um, and immobilizes them. And it's another sort of defense mechanism. Some sea cucumbers will actually ev eviscerate uh, as a defense mechanism. They will vomit out their internal organs. Um, and the idea is that it either distracts or it placates the predators. Um, and there's some uh, South Pacific uh, communities that will actually just eat the internal organs of sea cucumbers, put them back in the sea, they regrow their organs, and they carry on their way, probably a little bit upset, but uh, otherwise no worse for wear. So they're fascinating creatures. They're quite simple. They're in the same family as starfish. They do have that pentaradial symmetry about them, and um, they're, they're, they're very, very fascinating to look at. They are, there are some conservation challenges. So the first one is that they are just sort of a lump. Again, they don't have that kind of cute fuzzy eyes of a, of a baby seal. They're also broadcast breeders. So what that means is you need a specific minimum density of animals in order for them to successfully breed. One sea cucumber or five sea cucumbers in a small reef will not have the density sufficient to actually repopulate that reef. And so what often happens in fisheries is fishing will increase to the point where the population drops below that minimum density. And then it doesn't matter how long you have bands or you have create protected areas, they won't recover or they will recover incredibly slowly. And, and that's a big problem. They're also incredibly easy to catch. You don't need hooks, you don't need lines. Uh, a lot of sea cucumber fishing is done by people gleaning and just picking up sea cucumbers on the shore. And then they slowly move deeper and deeper as the population depletes. And then the typical method is using a hookah uh, method for, there's divers that use scuba, but also the hookah method. Um, and people will fish in, in, in larger, uh, deeper waters, which is also very dangerous, um, as I'm sure many of you know, and I, I don't need to tell you, uh, there's, there's often people get the bends and other um, health and, and safety issues around deeper diving. And, and finally, I think one of the other biggest challenges as has probably come up is that um, sea cucumbers, no one knows what they are. Very few people know about them. And so you end up having to explain, as we, we you know, we talked about, uh, I think, yesterday, with some of our friends, they're not vegetables. They are an echinoderm. Um, but it's often people just don't realize that. So um, why are they caught? Why do people catch them in the first place? So there is no domestic, well, I can say no significant domestic consumption in Sri Lanka or India. Uh, they're destined principally for Southeast Asian markets, uh, China, Hong Kong, and millions of tons are transported annually to usually through Hong Kong or Chinese uh, ports into the Chinese market. They're consumed for two primary reasons. The first is for food and the second one is for uh, traditional Chinese medicine. I'm told that uh, in traditional Chinese medical practices, um, the sea cucumbers are salty and warm and so as a result they are somehow good for the heart, kidney, meridians, they nourish yin blood um, and they're often used for impotence and uh, issues around urination. And they're also, they've often been called, the other names are beche de mer, uh, the French, or trepang. And they're sold either dried, canned, frozen, or in extract form. And they're often referred to as the sea ginseng. So there's quite a sort of strong interest in, in sea cucumbers in Southeast Asian markets. As people may know, ginseng is sort of a very important element as well. And they're, they're valuable. So this is a market from, uh, from Hong Kong. And you can see that the price of sea cucumbers has gone up dramatically in the last few years. In the 1960s, they would sell for about $3 a kilogram. In the 1980s, $60 a kilogram. In the 2000s, we're looking at about $370. This is American, by the way, uh, kilograms uh, per, per kilogram. And uh, last year, you could find a kilogram of your sort of the Fusca Gleba, so one of the major species from Sri Lanka, would sell for $400 US per kilogram, which is about 80,000 rupee in Sri Lanka. So that's quite a lot for a sea worm. Um, the most expensive one is the Astropicus, the Japonicus, which is a, a temperate sea cucumber. It's a, If you go back, I go back here, it's this little spiky guy right here. Uh, these will sell for almost 3,500 USD per kilogram. Um, the species that you're most likely to get, oh, here we go, here's my, my pricing guide. Um, the the Holotheria scabra, which is a tropical species, so more the type that you might find around uh, Sri Lanka, that's the most expensive. It would sell for 1,800 kilogram, per kilogram. And then the Fusca gleba, the white teat fish, um, that's a Cites protected species, and it would sell for about $400. Now I am seeing I have questions here, so I'll, I'll pop on those in a second before we transition. Um, actually, I'll check those now. Oh, no, 
Can they survive out of the water? Um, yeah, so they, they can. They, they do, um, the good question. The question was, do, can they survive out of the water? The answer is yes. Um, they, are, they are often found in the intertidal regions. So you'll, if you are walking on the beach at low tide, you'll often find sea cucumbers up at, among the rocks. Um, they can't live out of water for very long, but they can sort of live in that splash zone um, in the intertidal area. And some of them are deep sea sea cucumbers. Some of them can live in that tidal area. Um, they probably won't survive. Out of, I, I don't know actually how long they would survive out of water, but not not a couple of weeks, maybe a day or two if necessary. But I imagine they would have they would dry themselves out quite quickly. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Oh, and then let's just check one more question. Ah, thank you. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> Excellent. We make this the interactive part here. There we go. So. This is sea cucumbers, by the way, drying on the street in Hong Kong last time I was out there. One of the strange and, and I think things I find very interesting about the way that luxury seafood products are treated in Hong Kong is those are shark fins, those are sea cucumbers, those are thousands of dollars worth of merchandise of luxury seafood products, and they are quite literally drying on the surface of the road. That is a city street in downtown, in, in Shenguan, in, in Hong Kong, and those are just sea cucumbers sitting on the ground. That to me is kind of undermines the whole idea of it being a luxury food. Most people don't find their luxury food in the actual gutter. Um, let's talk about sea cucumber fisheries in India and Sri Lanka. Now I've combined the two of them because there's some really interesting features which I'll be telling you about. Ah, there was a question, are they farmed? Would that be a solution? Some species are farmed. The Japonicus in Japan is farmed and um, I haven't looked as much into the aquaculture, so I won't uh, speak from a position of, of detailed information, but there are some species that are able to be farmed. Some of them, it doesn't work very well. It depends on the species, but that can be seen as a partial solution. Um, I haven't looked into that enough to know about the sustainability of all the different operations, and I find they tend to vary significantly. But yeah, that's that's a good, good question. Before we jump into specifically Sri Lanka and India, are there any other questions more broadly about just sea cucumbers in general? Feel free to pop those in the chat as we go along and, um, and I'll get to them. So there's actually quite a long history of sea cucumber fishing in Sri Lanka and India. It goes back almost a thousand years and you had Arab and, and Chinese traders in the region for, for that period of time. And the principal region is the Gulf of Manar and Polk Bay. And there's some interesting legal structures in place. So India has been trying to protect sea cucumbers for, for decades. And in 2001, they banned all fishing of sea cucumbers. They are a Schedule One of the Indian Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. It is illegal to catch sea cucumbers in India. Um, and that was after attempts at, at regulation and attempts at, at quotas and reduced fisheries. They just didn't work. And so there's a full all-out ban in India. In Sri Lanka, there it's, it's a bit more complicated. So the fisheries are predominantly no located in the northern portion of the island. I think I have my, another map here one of our local fish. Um, in the northern part of the island, um, you require a license and permits, and the permitting numbers of permits that have been available have been reduced um, as populations have declined. And just to a bit more specificity around Sri Lanka, the Gazette notification number 1665-16 uh, from August 2010 established sort of regulations around sea cucumber fishing, and there's licensing and, and individuals are required to pay two rupee per kilogram. There's three new species of sea cucumber that have been added to the CITES list. Um, I'm happy to explore CITES if people aren't familiar with that, uh, but it's an international legislation to protect um, endangered species. And um, three species were added in 2019, the white teat fish, the Fuscogliva, the black teat fish, or the, the Whitmay, um, and the Noblis, uh, the Holotheria Noblis, which is also called the black teat fish, uh, confusingly. One thing that I always find fascinating with sea cucumbers, and I'm sure many of you have found with some marine species, is that they don't often have common names. They're just, they're called by their Latin name, which I always find kind of fascinating. In 2020, there was 18 ex 180 expert permits in Sri Lanka for sea cucumbers, and roughly uh, 350,000 kilograms were directly exported, and about 9,000 kilograms were re-exported in about 300 shipments. Those are the legal ones, of course, um, not talking about the illegal ones. And here's some examples of what sea cucumbers look like. That's a live one. I hope some of you have seen them when you're out diving. Um, when they're dried, they're gutted and they're dried. And uh, obviously the, the quality of the drying process also influences the, the price. And you can kind of see here some examples of the white teat fish and the black teat fish, both um, happily enjoying their lives and, and also dried out. 
Uh, I should also add, just for, I'll keep it here for a sec, for, for Sri Lankan purposes, there's about 24 species of sea cucumber in Sri Lankan waters. 20 of those have been exploited commercially, but in reality, it's more like nine species that are actively commercially exploited. Um, the north and northwest and northeastern portions of the country are where there are legal sea cucumber fisheries. The entire southern fisheries have all collapsed and they're, they're, it's, they've been closed. Um, hopefully they're, they're recovering, but as I said, because sea cucumbers are broadcast breeders, you, you may or may not get that kind of recovery. Now, one of the interesting things you get with, with comparing Indian and Sri Lankan laws is that India has a complete ban, Sri Lanka does not. And that creates an opportunity for criminals. Uh, basically, what happens is sea cucumbers that are caught illegally in India are smuggled into Sri Lanka and then re-exported as uh, they're laundered in effect. They become sort of a legal, in heavy air quotes, um, sea cucumber, and they're reintroduced into the licit and legal markets. And so there's two major crimes associated with sea cucumbers. The first is poaching, so fishing illegally. And the second is smuggling, which is moving those illegal products. And um, basically, those are there's also associated crimes. So people who engage in illegal fishing also have to hide their money. So there's money laundering, there's tax evasion, forgery and corruption are all kind of associated crimes. So I started looking at sea cucumbers, just to go back to our original story, um, around the world. And I was doing a global survey of what's going on in the sea cucumber fisheries. And I started getting a lot of news stories coming out of India and Sri Lanka. And we kind of got the sense in our research team that it was a hot spot. And so what we did is we decided to, there we go. Um, we decided to look at India and Sri Lanka specifically. So I did a, a media survey. I was telling Emmett before we started here that um, I would have liked to have been there on the ground doing field work, but of course COVID has prohib prohibited that. So this became a desktop study. From 2015 to 2020, um, we looked at media stories documenting um, instances of crime related to sea cucumbers. Those were popular media sources as well as press releases given out by the Sri Lankan Navy. There was 120 incidents in total, 50 in India, 70 in Sri Lanka, that culminated in a total of 52 arrests, four people on average, um, and the, the ages ranged from 15 to 63. And what was interesting here is you'll notice there's four people being arrested per incident. And recall my, the definition of organized crime is more, three or more people engaged in criminal activity. So many of these operations are organized criminal activities um, in that context. So. I should mention that the survey, there's some limitations, obviously. Um, I was operating English, so we were only looking at English language sources, so it's entirely possible we missed some instances. And there was a lot of discrepancies between the value um, and the number. Police reports and news reports often round up, they round down, they provide weights, but we didn't know if, sometimes if the species were alive or dried out. When they're dried out, they lose a lot of their weight, as I'm sure you can imagine. Uh, a live sea cucumber or a dry sea cucumber is only 8% the weight of a, of a wet sea cucumber. So if we know if they're alive or dead, we can, and dried rather, we can do the math, but often we didn't. So we, we were juggling around some, some rough numbers there. And we also had some concerns about, you know, if we increase attention around illegal uh, sea cucumber operations, might we accidentally encourage people to enter into the field because there's money to be made uh, potentially. So we did, what, we did have some concerns around that. Um, and, and ultimately we, we, we worked around those problems, but I just wanted to highlight those as, as potential risks. So we, we docked into these cases and then I mapped them all out. Um, now the mapping allowed us to really look at how sea cucumber crime has evolved over time. So this is sort of the Southern part of India and Sri Lanka. And you can see there's, a, we'll show you the graphs later on for increases. But what was really fascinating is you start to see cases in 2020 spreading out from this core in the Palk Bay, Gulf of Manar area. And I'll zoom in on that. You can kind of see these different clusters around different areas um, emerging as sort of hot spots. So one of the reasons we wanted to map out the sea cucumber crime was to, first of all, give the authorities an idea of like hot spots and where maybe you could focus your policing attention, um, but also to see if it changed over time. And this is actually quite important because in the wildlife world, in, in the wildlife, excuse me, in the wildlife crime world, there's something called the roving bandit, uh, pro, uh, roving bandits, and something called serial exploitation. So serial exploitation is quite a straightforward concept. It basically happens when um, and one area is completely depleted of a species and those who are exploiting it move on to another area and they move on and they, they move in a serial way. And 
this is sort of a boom bust cycle of a lot of different wildlife product and extractive industries. You take an area, you strip mine it, you move to the next. Roving bandits um, are individuals who have been displaced as a result of that process. So you're a local fisher, but suddenly all the fish that you catch are gone. So what do you do? You, you pull up stakes and you go off to find fish somewhere else. Well, now you're fishing in someone else's waters and you're going to deplete those fish eventually and those people and you move on. And the challenge you get is these people aren't connected to the local situation. They don't live there. And so they don't often have an incentive to protect the species. They become bandits. They go at night, they take all the fish and they leave. And that, of course, creates these knock on on serial effects. And so roving bandits are a problem because local fishers typically have an interest in sustainability because they want to fish tomorrow. They want to fish next month. But if the person isn't connected to the space and they're just traveling through to strip mine the products, the wildlife products rather, then that creates huge conservation issues. So when we mapped out sea cucumber crime in Sri Lanka and India, not only did we notice sort of shifting patterns in the Polk Bay Gulf of Benar area, but we also noticed that they were spreading to Lakshwadeep only in 2020 with one case in 2015 as well as the Adam and Nicobar Islands. And so we kind of, the, the big worry was that um, sea cucumber crime has been heating up in the Gulf of Manar and Polk Bay area. However, you'll notice we're only, we're documenting arrests. And so that, that's a good thing. That means that those people have been stopped by the authorities. Criminals know this. And so if you have more arrests in one area, they're going to go somewhere else. And the risk is that they're going to other areas and like the, um, Lakshwa Deep or Adma and Nicobar Islands are very remote and make and policing is much more complicated than the already difficult challenge um, of doing policing work in say um, any coastal area. So that was something that we we, we found from our, our study and it was quite alarming to say the least and we've been trying to encourage specifically the Indian authorities to really focus attention on Lakshwa Deep and, and Adma and Nicobar Islands which is again a, a huge challenge. So let's go into the numbers a little bit because it's uh, it's always interesting to sort of look how things change. So over these last five years, we have 64.7 metric tons of sea cucumbers were seized by the authorities. Um, one of the challenges we have when we're studying illicit and, and hidden illegal um, activities is these are only the cases where they were caught. Presumably these criminals, because you've noticed they've been continuing over the last five years, they're making money, they're exporting even more sea cucumbers. So the 64 metric tons are only seizures. And we, we don't have an estimate as to what percentage of, of smuggling opportunities are actually result in an arrest, but there's a lot of sea cucumbers leaving India and Sri Lanka. And so that, that kind of breaks down about 40 tons in India, about 24 tons in Sri Lanka. The average seizure was only 344 kilograms. I shouldn't say only, that is a lot of money, by the way. Um, but at the same time, uh, some of them were huge, some of them were very small. So there's quite a bit of disparity between the size of seizures. Sometimes it was a couple of fishers with a bucket. And then sometimes it was a huge smuggling operation, which I'll, I'll talk about momentarily. And the average of 871 sea cucumbers per incident, that's 104,000 animals. And the average um, overall value of that was, um, again, a very conservative estimate of $2.8 million USD with about 23,000 USD per incident. But again, they, they range from $26 to half a million dollars in, in the size of seizures. Uh, by the way, that's, we're talking about half a million dollars, that's 528 billion uh, rupee. Um, so that's, that's a decent chunk of cash for wildlife exploitation. So we can look at sort of the, the growth over time. So this is the, the number of incidents. So this bodes both well and bad for sea cucumbers. It's good because it means the police and authorities are taking an interest and, and more attention and more arrests are happening. It's worrisome because those arrests have to take place. So we see a large uh, increase in the last few years of arrests. Again, um, some of those arrests have been because the authorities pay more attention, but also there's a lot of crime going on. Mm. Those are incidents. These are actual arrests. So the arrests have been increasing significantly with uh, Sri Lanka making considerably more actual arrests than India. One thing you find though in these cases is that the people arrested are poor fishers. They're not the kingpins, the operatives, the middlemen. And there's actually two levels of exploitation here. There's the, the marine exploitation of the species and also the exploitation of fishers. They get paid maybe 50 cents a, a sea cucumber, which would sell for couple hundred, maybe thousand dollars in Hong Kong. So there's lots of levels of exploitation. And one of the things that we've been very passionate about is trying to break up the networks, take out the head, the head operatives, and you know, work your way through the, the network to actually take on your kingpins as opposed to just continually arresting low-level fishers. 
Um, these are uh, the values of seizures. So you can see that the value of seizures is kind of not quite consistent with the number of arrests, which suggests that fishers, the, the, the criminals are pulling in fewer and fewer animals. And that, that's kind of interesting in and of itself. And this is our comparative of wet and dry. Wet means alive or dead and dry means processed. And you can kind of see that a lot of the seizures are taking place um, in, in situations that are, are wet where the animals are still alive. And um, yeah, and that, that's a problem. So there's a question here. I'm gonna jump to that now here. It says, um, could you please briefly explain about answers for illegal fishing? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I, I might dive into that towards the end because I do come up with some recommendations. So let me put a pin in that one if you don't mind. Um, uh, Anushka and Anushka, then I will I'll, I'll I'll catch the one at the end if you don't mind. And there's another question here: um, sea cucumbers standing erect on the reef. Why would they do that? I, I'm afraid I don't know. Um, it, they might be broadcast breeding. Um, I I don't know. Yeah, I'm not uh, I'm not a behavioralist, but that is fascinating, interesting behavior. Um, yeah, I'm I'm sorry I don't know. Maybe someone else uh, has a bit more knowledge of of their actual behaviors. And someone asked, can sea cucumbers survive in toxic water? Um, that is an interesting question. I, I think it would depend on like, the level of toxicity. The, the, the really interesting research is about their ability to sort of reduce the acidity of water, but they're not, we're not talking about incredibly hardy animals that, can, that are like a, I don't know, like a tardigrade or something that's very hardy. So I, I would suspect that if you had a certain level of water pollution, it would, it would kill a sea cucumber, but I, I don't know the levels and I, I, would, I wouldn't want to do, necessarily do that research myself, but uh, they are, they're, they're like a starfish. So you're, you're not looking at a particularly aggressively hardy animal, even though they do provide a lot of ecosystem services. Yeah, good questions. Thank you. Yeah. So, so looking at the seizures, just to return to our, our stats, you're seeing a lot of arrests of sea cucumbers that are live, which means that the authorities, the Navy, local wildlife police, local authorities are arresting fishers, but not necessarily the people who are selling the processed materials to the markets, the, the middlemen. Uh, this is the, the average weight of sea cucumbers seized. You'll see there was a really big one in 2015. That was, they, they took down one go down and it had many, many tons of sea cucumbers in it. Um, but you have kind of a consistent trend towards um, you know, an average amount, roughly. One thing I found that was really fascinating is, and this kind of reflects that the point I made at the very beginning of my talk around illegal fishing being organized crime. These aren't just a random people in a boat. I mean, there are instances of random people in boats, but you actually have really sophisticated operations. They're quite large scale. Um, and they're organized such that the reason you get this kind of spike, this, this huge single go down that had tons of sea cucumbers in it, was that um, they've been collected there. So the middlemen were buying up sea cucumbers from local fishers. This was, in, I believe, in Lac Chaudip. And they were buying up sea cucumbers and hoarding them in a stockpile. And then when they had a sufficient amount, they would establish a drop site. And some of the police were actually reporting uh, bags or bales of sea cucumbers floating at sea with GPS beacons on them being picked up by boats. Like these really sophisticated operations. We're not just talking about a person carrying a suitcase across the border. We're talking about quite sophisticated operations. There's lookouts. One thing that I found very surprising was that when you look at arrests, um, there's a lot of people who get away because you'll have a lookout and they will alert people that the police are coming. And so the number of people uh, who are arrested and the number of people involved in incidents is not the same. And that was quite, quite alarming. Um, this is just a return to values. So we are talking about a decent amount of money. Um, uh, $1.3 million USD uh, in the last five years. And these are just seizures again. So imagine that let's pretend we were catching only 20% of all the criminal activity. That is millions of dollars that are being smuggled. The question was what happens to all the sea cucumbers that are seized? Um, that is a great question. And I'm actually really happy to answer this one. Going through the records, uh, there was at least five news articles that I can recall that said that the sea cucumbers were released into the sea. So if they were caught live, um, I, do, I do know that the Sri Lankan and Indian authorities would release them after documenting them, of course, to the sea, which was very reassuring. Um, and obviously if they're dead, they're, they're dead. As far as the dried ones go, I don't actually know where those end up. I know some countries have had controversies about selling them because obviously then you're supporting illicit markets. Um, so I don't know what happens to them in India or Sri Lanka. Um, and that's something I will, I will actually ask the, the authorities next time I talk to them, because that's, that's a really good question. And thank you for that one. But yeah, it was really reassuring. And it was kind of heartwarming to say oh, the, the, the 12 sea cucumbers that were seized were released to the sea. Um, and I think that's also reflecting the authorities understanding the importance of these animals. 
And, and the importance obviously goes beyond just money. I mean, folks here are divers and, and, and you know, spend time outside and, and the role that sea cucumbers play in the marine ecosystem is a very important one. And uh, we often appreciate the showy things, the new to branches, the, the, the fun reef fish, but the, the real hard workers of the reef um, are often neglected, the, the sort of the, the lovely sullen sea cucumber. So again, this is the value of seizures. You can see there was a big spike in 2015, a bit of a lull, and then in the last few years, the authorities have really taken attention to this, such that they've, they've created task forces, and, and I'll speak about some of the efforts they've done in, in, in a few minutes, but there has been a lot of, of seizures, and you can see the values here are quite significant. Um, this is the average um, value of a seizure by the authorities. And I kind of want to include this because it kind of contextualizes the size of criminal operations, right? We don't, often don't know if, you know, it's one small boat or if it's a huge, you know, you know storage facility, but you can kind of see this data is a little messier in that there was a couple of big instances, um, big seizures uh, in, in 2015, things kind of died off and they're picking up again. And I think that's kind of an interesting dynamic that we see. I'm just seeing a question here. Ah, yes, I will... Uh, we will we will we will chat afterwards about uh, communications. I appreciate that one, and uh, I'll put my communicate I'll put my contact information up at the end as well, so people can get in touch, because uh, we'd love some support and we'd love to work with local folks. So, th so just returning actually, yeah, returning to our, um, our our graphs. Basically, we have a really highly organized operation, and one thing that is fascinating to me, and, and as I mentioned many times now, that sea cucumber crime is organized crime, and it's not just organized crime in Sri Lanka and India. There was a case in the, uh, the United States where sea cucumbers were being used to hide and launder drugs. The really fascinating thing about that story was there was, uh, I think the investigators found out about this case because there was a company that was selling millions of dollars of sea cucumbers in that state, I think in the town of Buffalo or something. And it turns out that you couldn't buy sea cucumbers in the state. And the authorities were like, who are they selling them to? And it turns out nobody, there were no sea cucumbers. It was a front for drug money and they were laundering drug money through a sea cucumber company. Um, this other headline is one of the most startling, which was the Yakuza in Japan, uh, in, I think this is uh, 2018, made more money poaching sea cucumbers than they did selling methamphetamines. Um, and there's a reason why you see a lot of criminal syndicates like the cartels in Central America moving towards wildlife crime. And that's often because it's safer. If you get caught smuggling drugs into Indonesia, they have the death penalty. It's very serious. You go to jail for a very long time. But if you get caught with some sea cucumbers in your suitcase, you might just get a fine. They may not even know what you're carrying. And so you have like, remember that, that fish maw I showed you, $96,000 for a fish maw. That's more expensive than a sports car. You can't get a sports car across the border, but you might be able to smuggle a chunk of fish through. And so you actually see cartels diversifying their portfolios from say hard drugs, guns, uh, humans um, and expanding and diversifying their portfolios, their criminal portfolios into wildlife crime. And um, this is some of the some of the stories around um, uh, around around India. So we've seen a bit of inc an increase in in sea cucumber crime in India and Sri Lanka, principally because um, well we've are, we've been doing a bit of this. It's always fun doing research on a subject that you're also trying to increase awareness of. So this is one of the stories around some of our work. And oh, hold on, let's go back there. Well, I just want to do some concluding thoughts before we do. Sorry about that. There we go. So a, a couple of interesting things that, that have happened that are, I think worth pointing out is that we aren't screaming into the void here. The authorities have been listening and they've also been taking proactive measures. In India, uh, they actually created a sea cucumber protection task force in 2020, right before COVID hit. And then all the wonderful officers that were supposed to go off to Lakshwadeep to be trained um, kind of had to stay at home because of COVID. So that's been, been problematic or challenging. They've also set up anti-poaching camps in Lakshwadeep, which are now, they were being populated. Um, and they created the first sea cucumber marine protected area in Lakshwadeep, which is very cool. And I think one thing that's also very interesting about India is they've involved the Central Bureau of Investigation, their FBI, um, in, to investigate sea cucumber crime. Well, again, treating it not just like a simple administrative crime, but as a serious form of wildlife crime. And so basically they're involving some of their highest level of law enforcement. In Sri Lanka, a lot of the cases um, are dealt with by the Navy that do an excellent job on the high seas and by the local police. And uh, you see, again, you can see an increase of arrests reflecting the efforts the authorities are taking. There's still work needs, that needs to be done. When it comes to this kind of activity, you have a highly organized criminal entity. 
So you need to have a highly organized response. And that means coordination between Sri Lanka and India, as well as potentially market states like Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong or, or other market states. Um, that's really important. And sometimes it, the high level coordination between government heads is too complicated. It's too political. But interagency cooperation is really key. So like one local boat captain calling up another boat captain and telling him, hey, keep an eye open for this ship works just as well as high level diplomacy, often better. We also need more monitoring and enforcement. And this is kind of to the question that someone was asking about what can we do about illegal fishing? There is never one solution, unfortunately, but monitoring and enforcement is really important because both Sri Lanka and India have laws in place to protect sea cucumbers and other animals. But those are useless if no one's monitoring and actually enforcing those laws. And sometimes you need stricter punishments, and very often you do. What we find in illegal fishing is the fines that are levied on people who are caught fishing illegally are abysmally low. They become part of the cost of doing business. And so you'll see companies with millions of dollars of fish in their hold getting a $50,000 fine. That's like the cost of the amount of fuel they burn in a day. And they just continue on with their actions. So you actually need very aggressive punishments, particularly focused at the high level operatives, right? We're not talking about like, you know, poor fishers who maybe get caught with a couple of sea cucumbers in a bucket. We're talking about the operatives who are selling millions of dollars worth of sea cucumbers. They need to go to jail for a long time. We need to break up their operations. Some countries have actually taken to seizing and sinking boats involved in wildlife crime. And I, I think that may be an approach that's worth taking in certain situations, simply because otherwise those boats are fishing again the next day. Uh, if once they're released. Uh, but that's what Indonesia was doing under the, their fisheries minister, Susie, for many years. They sunk over 500 boats. They take them, empty them out, create reefs, which are, I'm sure, great for diving. You also need training. Um, one of the challenges you get is there are certain CITES listed species. In Sri Lanka, it's more complicated because you do actually have a legal fishery. So uh, law enforcement officers need to be trained in identifying species and, and working in the field. There's lots of techniques that you can use to identify these operations, but they're not the kind of common policing that, that's taught in police academies. That's very important. And I think critically, and this is the thing I've said many times, is you need to treat uh, illegal fishing as organized crime and tackle it just as aggressively as you would drug smuggling, people smuggling, arms smuggling, because it has, has a dramatic an impact and it can have a huge knock-on effect um, on the economy for fishers, on tourism by degrading reefs, um, and on government coffers by simply robbing them of money they would otherwise um, have to spend on, on any other project. So that's kind of some of the um, some of the aspects around sea cucumber crime and uh, in, in Sri Lanka and India, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here, but I will share my, my contact info here at the top. Actually, yeah, you can find my, um, I'll stop, hold on, there we go. There we are, hi. Um, yeah, so that's kind of our, our work stands at the moment. We're looking at doing in continued work on uh, sea cucumbers in the region. Um, Sri Lanka and India are a hot spot. There's a couple other hotspots around the world. One of them is Japan, as I mentioned. Um, we're somewhat hobbled in our research abilities there simply because um, of the language barrier. Uh, but also, um, I'm still working on figuring out the Japanese system. I've been, I studied whaling many years ago and I'm still trying to figure out how their system works. Um, but we're also looking at Mexico now as, as another hotspot. Central America is a hotspot for all kinds of wildlife crime. And my, one of my research assistants and I are, are doing a project there. And um, so I'll leave it at that. And I'm really happy to take any questions people have. Thank you very much for your patience and, and some of your questions. And um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much.